Amen. <laughs> All right. If you'll turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 1 with me tonight, please. Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts, chapter number 1. This book is written by Luke, the beloved physician. He addresses it to old Theophilus. The word Theophilus means lover of God. Theos and phileo, lover of God. Acts chapter number 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he'd chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, with many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Father, bless your holy word and this messenger. As I try to preach it tonight, we pray you'd open the hearts of the people to receive it as they receive it at this moment, and as they'll hear it later, I pray you'd bless it. Break it, Father, tonight, your holy word, the bread of life, as we break it and distribute it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The book of Acts is the New Testament book of history. It is unique. There's not another New Testament book like it. So many of the New Testament books, for example, the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all have their perspective on the life of Christ. But the book of Acts is different. It picks up with the ascension of Christ and goes all the way through until the Apostle Paul shakes his garments and says, All right, it must needs be so that the Gospel came to you Jews first, but seeing that you have refused the kingdom, then I go to the Gentiles, and lo, they will hear it. And believe me, they did. That's why we're here tonight, because we heard it, and we believed it, we were without God, and the book of Ephesians says we were without God, outside the commonwealth of Israel, ignorant, and yet God called us and made us a people who were not a people, that he prophesied in the, in the, in the Old Testament prophets. The book of Acts is the book of miracles. You can't read Acts without reading one miracle after another miracle after another miracle. It's remarkable that all that you read in here when you see this happen. Now you people today who take various positions on the miracles in the Bible. Some say, yes, these all happened, but all of this stuff they say is past. It's something that is no longer uh, necessary today because we have the canon of Scripture. But of course the problem with that is that we still have miracles. <laughs> Miracles are still being performed. They're happening around you all the time. Listen to this one. If you, when you hear this, it will remind you about when it happened. Four police officers who helped rescue a baby from an overturned car in a Utah River, March 2015, claimed they heard an unexplained voice calling from the car. The accident occurred after a car driven by Lynn Jennifer Grossbeck, 25, ran off the road and into the Spanish Fork River. Her 18-month-old Lily was found in her car seat upside down just above the frigid river water and had been there for at least 12 hours. First responders on the scene, including police officer Tyler Beddoes, told CBS affiliate KUTV that someone said, Help me from inside that car. It wasn't just in our heads, the officer said. To me, it was plain as day. I remember hearing a voice that didn't sound like a child just saying, Help me. Firefighters said they heard it too. All were emphatic that the voice came from the vehicle. Do you believe the firemen and the police officers? I would believe them in a heartbeat over a newsman or a politician in a heartbeat. I would believe these men. And they, of course, said they heard someone crying out, help me. 
Inside the car was the body of the mother, 25 years old. She died in the crash. Her little child was upside down, been there for 12 hours, right above the level of the water, and she was crying out for somebody to help her baby get out of that water. And they heard the cry. Now explain that. Go ahead and look up your book and find your book somewhere and see if you can explain that. It happened just as surely as you're in this house tonight. It happened. I'm not saying I have the answer for everything, but I don't question for a moment that God can warn us and He can cry out to us and He can give us direction when we need it. Amen. The book of Acts is a book of miracles from cover to cover, full of miracles. There's a crowd in the calls themselves Christians who do not believe in the miracles of the Bible. They believe the Bible is a is a in essentially a a kind of a, his, a, a pseudo historical book, and they believe that uh, the miracles performed in the Bible were really uh, for ignorant people who were easily uh, who easily fooled and swayed in the wrong direction, and and that then a lot of them even go so far as to say that the so called miracles that Christ performed, he did it by magic. And then you have the 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 Russian who went over to uh, into the into the into the mountains and back into the in back around Buddhism and all of that, and he did his own research and said that he came out of there believing that Christ had been there and that they had taught him the ways of Buddha and that he learned how to tap into the spirit world and that he never really did perform any miracles. Now, my dear friend, that's what's out there. That's what you have to deal with. That's the kind of people, and a lot of them, call themselves Christians. I believe the Bible. One of the greatest miracles that ever happened on this earth, you're looking at right now. <laughs> Amen. 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 Acts 1, verse number 3, the Lord Jesus Christ appears visibly and He ascends to heaven. Verse number 9, both of these are miracles because they, they attest to the resurrection of Christ. He's alive, that's a miracle. And He ascends into the presence of God, that is a miracle. Now Elijah went up in a chariot of fire. Enoch was no more for God took him. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, open heaven. Move it aside, I'm coming in. And by His own power and by His own righteousness, He approached the very throne of God. Amen. And angels on either side watched Him as this man who came first down into the world as the second person of the Trinity now rises and ascends into the presence of Almighty God as the God-man. And heaven opened and He sat down at the right hand of the Father. His work finished. Amen. So yes, that's a miracle. In Acts chapter number 2, you have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost comes upon the church and literally baptizes it with fire. And the church of God comes into a corporal existence. Now the church was here before that in the sense that believers were here. But here in Acts chapter number 2, you have the body formed. The body is formed in Acts chapter number 2. And the Holy Spirit comes down as cloven tongues of fire. And every man here heard in their own language the marvelous works of God. Remember, in their own language, they heard the works of God. In an un unknown tongue was the marvel was the was the language of over sixteen different nationalities, and these were all Jews here this day and proselytes into the faith. So the Bible says here in the book of Acts, it all starts with miracles and it begins to move forth with miracles God still performs miracles there are those who say well when that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be done away with that once we have the completed canon of scripture that we no longer have any need to, of miracles you tell that to the mother who baby over here at children's hospital with needles in its head and the doctors have given up on it and tell it it can't live and they want you to come in there and pray for it you tell it you tell mom that there's no hope that God's going to heal that child and raise it up because he doesn't perform miracles anymore. Well, I'm not going to tell her that. I'm going to pray that God heals that baby. About 40 years ago, I went to the children's hospital. There was a needle in the forehead of a little baby about this long. Went back in there in intensive care. Stood by the bedside of that baby and he looked at me and he said, Preacher, they've told me that my daughter cannot live, that she is going to die. I said, let's pray. And we called upon the name of the Lord and you know what happened? Turned around. She was healed. 
came out of that hospital, God healed that little girl. Amen. He still healed. I know systematic theology. It doesn't fit in their outline. I understand all that garbage. But I believe the Bible. I believe that if you've been given a death sentence by a doctor, he says that there's no hope for you. We thank the good Lord for our doctors. We appreciate what they know and what they can do. But folks, never take the doctor's word as final. Never. Never. Don't ever give up. Because the doctor says there's no hope. Our hope is not in man's ability. Our blessed hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 How many times have I stood by the bedside and prayed with people that had no hope and yet God raised them up. And I've seen down through the years many out here in this congregation that have been healed. And I've seen people saved after years and years and years of prayer for a wayward son, a wayward daughter, a wayward husband, wayward wife. Someone that they, other people have given up hope and said there's no way that old so-and-so could ever be saved. Well, listen, humanly possible there is no way. And humanly possible old so-and-so never could change their life. But the power of God at the cross of Calvary and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can cleanse all sin. And the soul has never been born that could not be saved. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. We make our own decisions. Acts chapter number 2 verse 43. Many miracles, the Bible says, were performed by the apostles. What's happening? He is authenticating and confirming the authority of the apostle and the power of his word. And that word goes forth to the ends of the world. What do you think, folks, that people who were taken and they were crucified upside down on X crosses like this, St. Thomas in Scotland, they have a cross like this that represents, not Thomas, Andrew. Andrew's cross in Scotland is like this. Tradition says he was crucified like that. Most of the apostles met violent deaths. And yet the cross of Christ is preached today because we believe, they believed, and there is power in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Don't ever give up hope. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter number 3 that Peter healed a man lame at the temple. This is one of the most beautiful scriptures in the Bible. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Amen. Do you have that to give? Freely we have received, freely give. Have you received anything from God that an unsaved man would want or need? Is there enough of testimony in your soul that you care enough for an unsaved man that you'll tell him about the Lord Jesus? You'll give him a track? You'll pray with him? You can't take somebody by the throat and force them to be born again. But there are people out there that are searching. They're looking. They're unsure. Or they may put on a show. But when it comes time to come face to face with death and God, they're not ready. They're there, folks. Just pray God opens the door. That you can get the word of God to them. Silver and gold have I none. Shows that the apostle Peter didn't have a bank account, right? But he touched into the bank of heaven. Such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And that man that was healed at the gate called Beautiful became a thorn in the flesh of every Jewish leader in Jerusalem from that day forward. Amen. Because they could do not deny that a notable miracle had taken place. And it took place at the hands of the apostle Peter. Amen. Upon this rock I build my church. Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom. And so it was. In the book of Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 5, here's another miracle. Two members of the church drop dead before the apostle Peter. You say, is that a miracle? You better believe it's a miracle. Ananias and Sapphira drop dead before the apostle. Believe me, from that day forward, he had their attention. And believe me, from that day forward, there was no problem Preaching about tithing <laughs> and what belonged to the Lord. The Bible says in the book of Malachi, will the man rob God? Does it say that? Yes, it does. And he said, and they said, well, how did we rob thee? 
We, he said, you robbed him in tithes and offerings. You say, preacher, I don't have money to tithe. I'm broke. That's why you're broke. That's why you're broke. The apostle said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread in the Old Testament. Do you know why? Because God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he's able to multiply the smallest might and make it multiply to your need. What is tithing, preacher? Tithing is trusting God in a way that you can't explain. Because you're laying your life before Him. That's what tithing is about. I don't preach a lot in here about tithing. You know why? Because that is the acid test of whether you mean it or not with God. When you really get serious with God, you'll put money in that plate. And that money in the plate is not for Preacher Lawson. That is your way of expressing to God, thanks. We've got Thanksgiving coming up, right? Thanksgiving. And how many times have I told you down through the years of all the holidays scattered out throughout the year, Thanksgiving is the most Christian of all of them. Because it was started by Christians, no question about it. They gathered together to give thanks to God where He blessed them. And when they were thanking God, they had hundreds of graves within walking distance of where they were. They had come over and their people had died that first horrible winter in 1620. And they had all these fresh graves. And yet when the harvest came in the next year, they gathered together, called the Indians in, and they gave a thanksgiving to God. Bradford writes about it in our Plymouth Plantation. A thanksgiving unto God. Are you thankful? That's one of the most telling things about your Christianity. Amen! If I could just get you to understand that. One of the things that God says to them, they are unthankful. Boy! How many of you had plenty to eat today? We can look at me and tell i got plenty to eat, no problem. Have you got a good place to sleep? Have you got a nice vehicle that will get you from where you're going to where you're going? Alright? you got the medication you need. you got the doctors you need. Look at the children you got. Look at these beautiful kids we've got in this church. we got some of those beautiful kids in the world right here at Temple Baptist Church. Amen? Why don't you try to make one one time? Try to do that. That child is a gift from God. Look at these little children. And they're growing up. Do we have anything to be thankful for? Here we are gathered together in this house tonight, praising and worshiping God, singing His songs, preaching the Word. And so many in this town, they're watching the football games. This morning they went to their church, they had the religious experience, but that's all they want. They want an hour with God. I never could figure that one out. An hour with God, and that's all they want. Folks, God is alive 24-7. He that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Yeah, man, you can flip God a time. You can flip Him a little hour of your time on Sunday morning, but there's a whole lot more to God than that. Amen. 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 Are you telling me I'm going to hell because I don't go to church on Sunday night? No, that's not what I'm telling you. But I am telling you this, you're living in the wilderness. And you're following afar off. And you're out there at Kadesh Barnea and you're afraid to go in because of the giants. Did you know, folks, that they had already gone in before those giants once before and had defeated them? Og, king of Bashan, they defeated him. His bed was 18 feet long. Imagine how big those people were. They'd already defeated them. They'd already faced the giants. And yet when they came to Kadesh Barnea and God offered them the land of Hebron, they could go in. He showed them the size of the grapes and the promises of God. What did they do? They all came back with an evil report, except two, Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb said, we can take it. And Caleb did, and so did Joshua 40 years later. For Caleb got a mountain, and Joshua led his people into victory, into the promised land. Amen. If you want to walk in victory, God will lead you into victory. If you want to wallow in self-pity and defeat, He'll let you wallow in self-pity and defeat. If you want to crawl up under a juniper tree somewhere and lick your wounds and blame everybody else in this world for your problems, you go right ahead. But as for me and my house, glory to God, we're going on. We're going to go on until it's over. Amen. I'm in the last leg of that relay. I've got the baton. I see the finish line. And by the grace of God, that's what I'm headed. Amen. 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 You can sit here tonight and you can think ain't nothing in this church that's worth coming to and have your mind a thousand miles away, but I'm going to tell you something. The church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the truth. It is here that God builds, blesses, and sends His people out. God has blessed us with a good church. How many believe that? 
We've got a good church. Amen. 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 You got sinners in it, preacher. Amen. But they know where the altar is. <laughs> and they know what the blood's about. And they know what it is to get right with God. Amen. I love Temple Baptist Church. Amen. I love this church. Glory to God. Signs and wonders, Acts 5.12. Peter healed many, the Bible said, in many cities. Acts 5.12. Prison doors were opened by an angel. Acts 5.19. Stephen wrought great wonders and signs. Acts 6.8. In Samaria, Philip did great miracles and signs. Acts 8, 6, 7, and 13. The Lord appeared to Saul. Saul, that's a miracle. <clears throat> he was a murderer headed to murder more people. Once you get bloodlust in your soul, you hard to get it out, folks. What's bloodlust? It is that serial killer that takes his first victim. And it gives him a rush, him or her. It gives them a rush. They have this feeling of power and control. It's hard to explain. And they try to tell the law when once they're captured. But once they enter into this bloodlust as a serial killer, it's one death right after another death, after another death, after another death. It gets to the point to where they couldn't care less who they're and what they're killing. It's all about how they feel. This rush that they're getting. This power that they've got. And every time, my dear friend, they're getting sucked closer and closer and closer to eternal damnation. For their heart is hardened more and more and more. Ted Bundy, right before he died, they called in a preacher, brought him back there to talk to him. Ted Bundy said this to the preacher. He said, I started with pornography. I started with pornography. And he said it grew from there. He said, once pornography had obsessed me and possessed me, he said, then I began to move out and move on for greater, bigger things. And then he started killing. Ted Bundy was one of the worst serial killers this country ever had. And do you know how he died? You ever seen a picture of his body, his dead body? It's quite a thing. Ted Bundy was brilliant. He was smart. That makes him an even worse serial killer because he's able to plan his next victim to kill more and more and more. And so to this preacher who came in that night and talked to Ted Bundy right before he died, he gave this confession of faith. He somehow or another said, the Lord has cleansed me and saved me. But the preacher walked out of there and here's what he had to say. He said, I really don't believe that he knew what I was talking about. That this was all a tactic that he had hoped this was his last chance to live, that by making a profession of faith, that maybe somehow or another they might be lenient with him and allow him to know this. He was grasping at straws as he came down face to face with death. And dear friend, death is a scary thing. Oh, it's scary. It's cold. It's final. You don't want to face death unprepared. And of course, Ted Bundy did. He died without God and he went to hell. You want to know where he is right now? He's in hell. He's in hell. Dead, but Ted Bundy is in the pit along with every serial killer that's ever lived and walked the face of this earth. If he hasn't been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's in a pit. And this country is full of cold cased files. You ever check on them? It seems like you can get away with murder quicker than you can bank robbery. You want to know why? If you rob the bank, you got somebody's money and they'll come after you. You kill somebody and they don't care whether they live or die. Unless you have, unless you have influence, know the right people. A most, there's so many right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Cold case files. People that have been murdered and they've never found their murderer. Murderer, you're going to hell. You may escape the police. You may escape the courts. You may escape justice in this world, but you will surely go to hell. Yeah. And when you wind up there, all of that blood will be required yeah. on top of your head. Remember that. Remember that. You see, the problem is that none of these preachers in the pulpit today are telling people that they're going to hell. It's all about how good you are and how God wants to bless you and how great it is and this great bank account in the sky. And all you have to do is have the right credit card and you can charge anything to the account of the great bank account in the sky. Name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. And look where the country's headed. What good are they doing? What are they doing to help people? The country is going to hell in a handbasket. Amen? Amen, folks. Amen. That's where it's headed. 
Why? Because the pulpit now is silent. You don't judge a preacher by what he says. You judge him by what he doesn't say. You'll find that that judgment is closer to the character of that man and that church than anything else. What he doesn't say. Because most of them on the surface appear to be orthodox and they're going to preach an orthodox line. They're going to preach certain things that are orthodox. I'm sure that if I asked some of the biggest name it, claim it, blab it, grab it preacher in the country, if they believed in the deity of Christ, they'd say, yes, I certainly do. Do you believe in the virgin birth? Absolutely I do. The death, burial, resurrection of Christ? Oh, yes, absolutely. These are all orthodox things. But they never say a word about what I just told you. Murderers are walking right now that are one step away from hell, fire, and damnation. And you will not escape God. Amen. Ananias and Sapphira. Boy, I'll tell you what, if I'd have been there that day and watched them drop dead in front of that apostle, I think it might have done something the way I see things and think, wouldn't it you? Yeah. Amen. Signs and wonders continue to be performed. Peter healed many all over the place. Prison doors opened by angels. Stephen wrought great wonders and signs. Philip did great miracles and signs. Lord appeared to the apostle Paul. Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. He saw the vision on the roof and the prison gate opened. And then it begins to switch. In the book of Acts, from the emphasis upon Peter to Paul. You see this in Acts chapter number 13. You see a switch. You see, you see no longer the emphasis is on Peter. Now it's on Paul. Acts chapter number 13, Paul blinded Elamus. Acts chapter 14, Paul miracles in Iconium. Acts chapter 14 again, Paul healed a crippled man at Lystra. In Acts chapter 16, Paul heals a woman possessed of an evil spirit. Notice that? Acts chapter 16, miraculous earthquake, chains and doors open at the Philippian jailer, and out comes the apostles. Paul performed miracles at Ephesus, Acts 19. He raised Eutychus from the dead, Acts chapter number 20. That's what you get for being a long-winded preacher, amen. amen. Let me say this while I'm on this. It's no mark of being spiritual to stand up in the pulpit for an hour and a half. And people get bored to death, their back starts hurting, and they're ready to go. If you can say it in ten minutes, then you have shown that you've got something to say. Did you know that if you really get into the Word of God, in thirty minutes of preaching, you can say a lot? Amen. Amen. So here's what I'd say to any young man starting in the ministry. Be conscious of this. Be conscious of the time that the people are out there listening to what you have to say. Pack as much as you can into that time and you'll hold their attention. And as long as you're holding their attention, you're going to get something from what you're doing. You're going to be preaching. But if you think preaching is a marathon where you have to preach for an hour or a half or two hours, I've heard them break. Say, well, bless God, I preached for two hours the other night. I, th I, say, I say to myself, how many were left? <laughs> You started with 200 and wound up with 10. <laughs> Listen to me. I'm serious now. I'm very serious. I never did plan to preach a certain length of time. I don't know why. But I do know this. I do know that in 42 years of preaching, I can go look at the time from what I preach. And it will average anywhere from 38 to 45 minutes. In there. Somewhere in there. Usually 30, 30, 35, sometimes 40 minutes. It will average that. I don't cut it off. I don't, I don't have a watch up here. Do you, ever, do you ever see me look at my watch? I look at it in Sunday school, but I never look at it preaching. Never, never, never. I preach until the message is gone, until it's over, until it's out there, and then I'm done. But for some strange reason that I have this set period of time that I preach the Word of God. You have got to be good for somebody to listen to you for an hour. Now, I'm not talking about football band, fans. You can watch them gather together over here in the rains, piling down, and I'm telling you, they're freezing and shaking, and, they're, and, and, and their teeth are chattering. And they'll get in on that stadium over there, and, they'll, and the ball game's at 4 o'clock, they'll start getting there at noon. And they'll come in there, and they'll sit there, and they'll have their ponchos on, and they'll shake, and they'll shiver. And then when the ball game starts, all of a sudden, this rush of adrenaline comes in, and they're fully alive. Amen. And the weather is irrelevant. That same crowd, if you bring them into a church house, and you keep them over an hour... They're ready to go. You know why? It's where your heart is. It's where your heart is. 
So what did the apostle do? He put Eutychus to sleep. That's what he did. Are you saying what it was wrong? I'm not saying that. I'm just simply saying Eutychus sat up there in that window. And he sat up there for so long. And he nodded. And then one time he nodded too much. And he came tumbling out of that window. And he fell out on the ground. And he died. Probably broke his neck. And there his dead body lay. Now that's a heck of a way to end a sermon, right? I mean, that's, that's no way to end a sermon. I mean, yeah, we... Old boy came over to the church and preached and we had three dead. That's not too bad, is it? <laughs> so Eutychus' body's lying there and the apostle walks over and he lifts him up. And life comes into that body. Amen. But listen to me. I could listen to the apostle Paul for a week. Couldn't you? Oh, yeah. That man, you could listen to the apostle Paul for a week. And you'd never get tired of what he had to say. Could you sit down on the banks and listen to the Lord Jesus for five hours? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No problem. No problem. <laughs> no problem at all. So, Eutychus, he raised him up from the dead. He heals a woman with an evil spirit. Look over here in Acts chapter number 28. A viper, a viper attaches itself to his arm when he reaches in to pick up a pile of wood. This viper attaches itself to him and not just bites him, attaches to him. And he shakes off the wood and here's this viper hanging on his arm. And the superstitious pagans looked at him and said, this is providence. This is his karma. You hear the karma all the time? Karma, karma, karma. This is his karma. He's being repaid for the wickedness. And so the Bible says he shook it off into the fire. And they looked at him and said, he'll start foaming at the mouth at any minute. And he didn't start foaming at the mouth. Well, he'll fall down and start twitching. He didn't fall down and start twitching. What happened to him? He just stood there and looked at him. What a friend we have in Jesus. Maybe he sang a song. Nothing happened to him. You know why? Because he didn't reach down and pick up that serpent and say that was worshiping God. That's not worshiping God. That is not worshiping God. If all you do every time you meet is pull out a bunch of snakes and you think that that's worshiping God, you're sadly mistaken. But if you're in the pulpit and you're preaching the Word of God and a rattlesnake gets loose and comes up and bites you on the leg, God can let, that, let the people see that snake right there and know for sure that you belong to Him when you just kick it off to the side. And that has happened time and time and time and time again. You ought to read the stories of the missionaries who talk about things like that where they've been bitten by deadly serpents, and yet they lived right through it because they're God's man doing what God wants them to do, and so he blessed them through it. And so it was in Malta. And then finally, Acts chapter number 28. He healed those on the island who were diseased. Now listen to this story. Ruby Graupera Casimiro claims she saw spiritual beings while dead for 45 minutes. She was clinically dead for 45 minutes after giving birth in September and has now spoken about her experience. Telling the public on Monday, she saw spiritual beings waiting for her. She says, I was dead, she told ABC News. My husband tells me you were gray, you were cold as ice, and you were dead. You had no color in your lips. She underwent a cesarean section at Boca Raton Regional Hospital in Florida. Doctors believe that the amniotic fluid entered her bloodstream, stopping her heart. Doctors worked on her, administering CPR and trying to wake their patient for three hours. Nothing worked. Just as they prepared to call her time of death, she spontaneously began breathing on her own. Forty Five minutes. No breath. No heartbeat. I remember seeing spiritual being who I believe was my dad, she said. I remember the light behind him and many other spiritual beings. I was chosen to be here. She goes on and says that she believes that we all have appointed time on this earth. And that when our time is up, she believes that God is going to call us home at the right time. I remember 40 years ago, we had a man who belonged to Temple Baptist Church. 
He had died clinical death. I remember it like it was yesterday. He told it. He got up and told it from the pulpit. He wanted people to know what he had experienced. And he tells how such a beautiful thing that he saw the Lord. He saw this beautiful light, this tunnel leading off into eternity. He said, but I came back. He said, I didn't want to come back. I wanted to go on. He said, but I came back. God wanted me here. And so for the rest of his life, as many people as he could tell, he told them about that experience. Now let me tell you this. How do you, how do you validate something like that? See, how do you prove what it is, where it came from? You can't. There's no way to validate it. There's no way to prove it. I told you about Maurice Rawlings, cardiologist, man on the treadmill, falls over, his heart stops beating, cardiac arrest, and the, the cardiologist gets him back, pounds on his chest, does something to get him, maybe he put the shockers on. I think he shocked him, brought him back. And when he brought him back, he had terror on his face because he said, I'm in hell. I've been in hell. Don't let me die, preacher. I mean, uh, doctor, don't let me die. So how do you validate things like that? You see, what do you do when you get into that? Well, let me tell you the, the best course to take, and I think it will help you with a lot of this stuff. It's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. But he said, such an one was caught up to the third heaven. That's what he said. Now, if that wasn't in the Bible, you might come along and say, well, these are all, you know, they're, 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 they're just people that are mixed up and they have hallucinations and uh, bad reactions to medication, this and that. But I don't believe that. I believe a lot of it's fakery. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I believe there's a lot of fake reading. I believe there's a lot of fake Christians. How many believe that? I do. Fake Christians. But I am not going to discount every experience simply because there's a lot of fakery. The apostle said, I was caught up into the third heaven. That's the presence of God. There's only three of them, not seven. Three. Dante, I think, mentioned seven heavens, his inferno. There's only three. The third heaven is the presence of God. In other words, I was caught up into the presence of God, and he said, I saw things unspeakable. It's not lawful, he said, for me to tell you. And sometimes, you know, when you, life gets hard, life gets hard. As you get older, the golden years are more like brass. I haven't found the gold yet. You have to get up four, five, six, seven times a night to go to the bathroom. There's no gold in that. If I get to sleep five hours or six hours in a night, I get up shouting hallelujah. I thought, man, I had a night's nice sleep. Six hours? Good night. I can go for a week on that. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, that's, you all know that. You understand that. The body just begins to deteriorate. The, the natural man, the, the outward man perishes. It's going to happen. I was as in good a shape as anybody in this house for the first 55, 60 years of my life. I ran all over this place, rode my bicycle for 20, 25 miles, everywhere, did everything. And then when I got to a certain age, I started falling apart. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Okay? And you get like that. And you've just buried your wife of 50 years or your husband of 50 years. Or one of your precious children. And the house is so lonely. And you opened up Second Corinthians chapter number 12 and the apostle begins to describe what he saw in the third heaven. You'd be mighty tempted to say, Lord, I'm ready to go to the third heaven. Yeah. And kind of help him out on the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, you would be. That's why he didn't put it in there. He said, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man. The things the Lord has in store for those that love Him. Heaven is a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place. One of the greatest things about heaven is the reunion. You're joining and grabbing hold of each other and hugging and knowing you'll never be separated again. Mothers and fathers grabbing their children. Husbands and wives grabbing each other. Family members. Old friends. Grabbing each other and say, hallelujah to God, I knew he told us the truth. I knew it. I knew he told me the truth because he gave me the earnest of the spirit. I knew it was here. I knew it because he saved me. And he put something deep down inside my soul that told me my home is up there, not down here. So we look from heaven from which cometh our salvation. What a grand day that will be.
just the reunion part of heaven. But then there's the glories of heaven. When you look at the city itself, streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, that's just the New Jerusalem. There's a whole lot more to heaven than the New Jerusalem. Amen, a whole lot more. There's the throne of God, the angels and seraphim and cherubim and the music. It'll get you when the first thing you probably notice when you get there is that constant singing as it just moves about everywhere you go. Singing was originated to worship God. It all started in Ezekiel chapter number 28. Music is a gift from God. How many agree with that? Music, I love music. Boy, for somebody that can't sing a lick, I love music. I mean, really, I love it. I listen to stuff that nobody listens to. I listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. On the YouTube, there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a YouTube uh, video of 10,000 Japanese doing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. You ought to hear 10,000 of them singing that. And I watch that. I look at that. And then I, there's a girl on there named Ofra Hazaz. And she sings Jerusalem of Gold. I've told you about her before. Look it up. Type it in. Jerusalem of Gold. Look that up. All kinds of beautiful stuff. I like to watch these Scottish bagpipers as they, as they, as they come marching in and they're playing Scotland the Brave. You ever heard that one? Scotland the Brave? Well, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Folks, the world's a lot bigger than Knox County. <laughs> And you get the old classic writers like Chopin. And there's one on there that's, uh, I forget the name of it, but I'll play that. I, every time I play it, it just it soothes my soul. Music was written to glorify God. It was given to glorify Him. We're going to a land of beauty, and we're going to a land of music, and we're going to a land of reunions, and then we're going to see God. And boy, when we see Him, it'll make it worth it all. I'm going to see God. And I'm not so sure I'm ready. It's probably going to scare me to death. Because I know how I am about the unknown. The biggest fear for me is the unknown. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the issue when I deal. It's the unknown. That's why I've always been in my whole lifetime. i got to find out why it ticks, when it ticks, where it ticks, how long is it going to tick, what started it ticking. That's the way I'm wired. And when I get into something that I can't look beyond, it's the unknown. Do you know what it is to cross from this life into that life? Have you know the experience? I mean, do you know exactly what it's going to be like to pass from here to there? I know where I'm going. How many know where you're going? That's not unknown to me. I know where I'm going. But it's the crossing over. You ever thought about that? The, the songs about it, crossing Chile Jordan. Crossing. It's the crossing over. That's the unknown. I'm not afraid of it, but it intrigues me. And then God. I don't know about you. <laughs> I mean, all this stuff out here, and all the size of this, this huge creation. <laughs> and He said, let there be. Amen. He's a whole lot bigger than what I see. Yes. You think you're just going, well, God, it's good to be here. <laughs> How you doing? Thought I'd drop by and have a little visit with you. No. I have to do. <laughs> and then he'll reach down and take hold of you. And let you stand by his grace. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word. Folk gathered in the house, bless them. We know whom we have believed. Lord, I know where I'm going. How many times in the last six years have I talked to you directly about that? No doubt in my mind. Heavenly Father, I consecrate my life to Thee again tonight. In the name of Jesus, I give You my life. And I consecrate this ministry to Thee. In Thy holy name, Amen. How many have ever heard of Senator Mark Clark? Mark Kirk, rather. Mark Kirk. He's a senator from Illinois. He uh, served in the Senate from uh, uh, 80s, 90s, 95, 2000, somewhere in there. But up to 2010, 2011, somewhere in there, he had a massive stroke. He was 58 years old. He had a massive stroke. Almost killed him. So he's lying in a coma. He hadn't come out of it. This is the initial time.
time of the stroke, he's in a coma. That's not unusual. I've been to the hospital so many times with stroke victims, and there's no response. And people are standing around wondering if they're going to live or die. That's what happens if it's bad enough. You're out of here. You may not be dead, but you're in a coma. He went into a coma. And then he said, while I was in that coma, he said, these angels walked up to the foot of the bed. And he said, the angels walked up to the foot of his bed and said, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? And there was no doubt in his mind what they meant. And he said back to them, not yet. And it wasn't long after that he came out of the coma. He wanted to stay here. He had reason to be here. I'm not judging the man's motives. But he said, not yet. So he came out of the coma. And he's alive now. But he had a massive stroke. They came to his bed and said, are you ready to go? Boy, carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. What would you do at 2 o'clock tomorrow morning? <laughs> You've had a good night's sleep. I mean, you, you laid down and you just went off into Never Never Land. And you're just sleeping up a storm. And then all of a sudden you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and here stands an angel at the foot of your bed. And looks at you and said, you ready to go? Amen. <laughs> are you ready to go? <laughs> are you ready to go? <laughs> are you ready to go? <laughs> My heart quit beating one time for over 12 seconds. I'm telling you the truth. I was, I was in the emergency room, ER. I never saw a doctor run so fast in my life. Here he came. Here came the nurse. Doctor went on one side of me. The nurse went on the other side. She grabbed my arm and she stuck it, needle into it, immediately. He looked at me and he checked my chest. He said, you know your heart. He could see the monitor in there. Your heart has been stopped for at least 12 seconds. We don't know exactly how long. If you get ready to die, folks, cardiac arrest is the best way to go. I'm telling you, I've been there. So if we're just going to take a day when we choose how we're leaving here, that would be my choice. Cardiac arrest. Heart stops beating. That's not a heart attack. That's not a heart attack. A heart attack is when the blood flow is cut off to the heart. There's pain associated with it. Cardiac arrest, no pain. And then the blood starts coming down from your brain, and you just kind of go off. And you're gone. There's no better way to leave here. It's a whole lot better than a bottle full of pills.